Good morning, Chairman. You're on mute, Chairman. Good morning and welcome to this online meeting of the Highways and Transport Scrutiny Committee. My name is uh, Councillor Bob Adams and I'm the Chairman of this committee. The audio feed of this formal public meeting is being broadcast via the County Council's website. And I would like to welcome the members of the press and public who are listening to this online. Before we begin, I'd like to confirm the councillors who are present uh, and uh, Katrina Cope will uh, call their names and go, th go through the list of those presents. Katrina. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. Could I please ask you to confirm your presence when your name is called? Councillor Bob Adams. Present. Councillor Stephen Rowe. Present. Councillor Tom Ashton. Councillor Mrs Wendy Bokit. Present. Councillor Chris Burris. Present. Councillor Mrs Jackie Brockway. Present. Councillor Rodney Grocott. Present. Councillor Robin Renshaw. Present. Councillor Adam Stokes. Present. Councillor Eddie Strangle. Present. Councillor Mark Whittington. Can I just go back and see if Councillor Tom Ashton's in, please? Thank you very much. Yes, um, apologies, Mr Chairman, for being a few minutes late. I was having difficulties logging in, uh, but I am present. Thank you very much. I'm just going to go back to Councillor Mark Whittington. Are you there, Councillor Whittington? He may join later then, Chairman. Thank you, Katrina. Um, we also have uh, in present Councillor Ray Wotton. Um, I'm not sure if Councillor Perriton Williams is here or not. I did see her name come up earlier, but I don't know whether she's here still or not now. Thank yeah, you, Chairman. I have received by email, Katrina, apologies for the prom councillor, Richard Davis, and uh, Cleo as well. OK, thank you very much for that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. So can I welcome all the officers to the meeting and ask that you introduce yourselves at the beginning of your item or when you make a contribution. I would like to ask members of the committee and other participants to type speak in the chat function when you wish to ask a question or make a contribution. Requests to speak will be collated by the vice chairman. Also, just a reminder, please turn off your camera and microphone when not participating in the meeting. So can we go on to the formal items on the agenda, please? Apologies for absence, Trina. Uh, We've not received any apologies for any members of the committee, but as you said earlier, we received apologies from Councillor Richard Davis, Executive Council for Highways, Transport and IT, and Councillor Cleo Perriton williams Executive Support Council for Highways, Transport and IT. Oh, Councillor Perriton williams is here. Hi, <laughs> Cleo. We were given your apologies earlier. We're on mute, Councillor Perriton williams Thank you. We'll come back to clear. Okay. Fine. Right. Uh, can we then move on to head apology de declarations? Sorry, are there any other apologies other than those given? No, Not Chairman. Given. Uh, can we move on to item two, declarations of members' interest, please? Any members have any interest to declare other than those that are uh, already in the members' declarations of interest? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Move on to item three minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of January. These circulated. Can I take those as read, please? I'll take that as a yes. Uh, can I have a proposal? Sorry, I didn't hear myself there. Could I have a proposal and seconder, please? Happy to propose, Chairman. Thank you. Happy to, Adam. Happy, to, happy to second, uh, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Can we go to the vote, Trina, please? Thank you, Chairman. Can members please indicate, it, indicate whether you are for, against, or abstain when your name is called, please? Uh, Councillor Bob Adams. For. 
Councillor Stephen Rowe. Four. Councillor Tom Ashton. Four. Councillor Mrs Wendy Bokit. Four. Councillor Chris Brewis. Four. Councillor Mrs Jackie Brockway. Four. Councillor Rodney Grocott. Four. Councillor Robin Renshaw. Four. Councillor Adam Stokes. Four. Councillor Eddie Strengel. Four. And Councillor Mark Whittington. Four. I'm here now, uh, Trina. I had a few slight problems in connecting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you for confirming. So that's unanimous then, Chairman. Thank you, Mark, and welcome to the meeting, Mark. Can we go on to item four? Announcements by the Chairman, Executive Councillor and Lead Officers. <coughs> Theo, any, anything from uh, your good self or Richard? Cleo's written that she can't um, hear anything. However, there are no announcements by the Executive. Thank you for that, Steve. Thank you, Cleo. Uh, lead Officers, any announcements, please, from Karen? No announcements. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I have got uh, no uh, other announcements either, so we'll move on to item five, uh, which is a call for action, uh, and <coughs> we'll ask uh, Councillor Ray Wooten to address the committee. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mr Chairman, may I start by taking this opportunity to thank those who have supported my council call for action. Mr Chairman, I have not done this lightly, but with determination that a solution can be found to resolve this long-standing complaint as soon as possible after exhausting all other areas. Taking action that would help the farmer, Mr Elmore, and local residents, but also those who wish to visit a walk in this attractive part of Lincolnshire. Mr Chairman, you will see that I have the support for this call for action process since submitting this, Barfton and Syston and Parish Council have met and supported this call 100%, along with the District Councillors and the local MP, Dr Caroline Johnson. This action has also been supported by six local households who live on West Street. The complainant, Mr Steve Elnor, owns Mill Farm, which is located at the end of West Street, Barkston where generations of his family have lived since the 1930s. West Street is a small country lane leading to Mr Elnor's farm and is a dead end. Mr Elnor has repeatedly had his route obstructed by parked cars when using his farm equipment over the past few years and has seen since last March at the start of COVID pandemic increasing numbers of traffic parking either obstructing his route or damaging the roadside verge. Mr Elnor is at his wit's end and is hoping LCC can help. You can see by the photographs taken, Simon, first photograph please. You can see by the photographs taken how bad the area has become with many vehicles getting stuck in mud and creating obstruction. Now, this first photograph you see is a passing point which Mr Elnor had to pay at his own expense regarding an application for an um, outside camping area. Next photograph, please, Simon. You can see the state of the, of the verge that's getting that. That is a small number of cars there. Next photograph, please, Simon. This is Mr Elnor with his tractor trying to get along there, and also in front is one of his vehicles as well, being obstructed on the day. And the last photograph, please, Simon. That is the state of the verge. Now, those white posts are in, put in place by Mr Elnor to try and stop parking uh, on, on the verge. Although they are not placed there with authority, they are legally uh, legal standard marking posts, which the County Council use. Thank you very much, Simon. Mr Chairman, the government and this authority has encouraged members of the public to take exercise. People are being drawn to this area by word of mouth and on social media to walk along the adjacent Drift Lane, which is subject to a Section 34 Highways Act 1988 vehicle restriction to the River Witham, where walkers can cross by stepping stones. So an attractive location to visit even at this time of the year. 
Mr. Elnor, at his own expense, fitted locally authority approved posts to discourage parking, as I said earlier, but still visitors block his entrance and exit. Although not legally approved, Mr. Elnor was desperate for his access not to be blocked. Even during total lockdown, people still coming and parking outside his farm premises. Many drivers are now getting stuck, causing even more inconvenience. Since submitting this call for action, the favoured solution by those that have contacted me is the creation of a parking space for six vehicles. This could be achieved by placing GR14 grass reinforcement and PP50 permeable paving or anchored ground reinforcement grip at a lower cost than tarmac parking bays. Mr Chairman, I note the response from the highways with all the costs involved. However, the concerns and problems of my residents are my priority, and as such, this is their preferred option. Other solutions, such as restrictive parking and stopping up orders, require enforcement, which is a, in a rural area would be hard to police. Finally, Mr Chairman, it's clear that this needs resolving. I request that this committee also support my call for action along with the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board and work with the highways managers to find a solution for my residents' concerns as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wharton. Could I ask uh, Chris Miller, Team Leader, Countryside Services, to come in at this point, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think Councillor Wooten's covered all the uh, major points of the report regarding um, the evolution of the problem, um, clearly since lockdown and um, the Prime Minister's um, indication that you know, one of the things we can do is go out and exercise. Clearly, that's been a very popular activity across the country uh, and not least in Lincolnshire. Um, and it has meant that you know, we have seen these sorts of incidences uh, on the highway network where honeypot areas such as Barkston um, have seen you know, accumulations of vehicles over the past 12 months. Uh, within the report, based on um, discussions with Mr Elnor and with Councillor Wooten and latterly with the Overview Scrutiny Management Board, um, we went through the list of potential options available, which Councillor Wooten's already alluded to. Uh, inclusive of the potential of stopping up rights, um, restricting physically some of the parking, but also also um, the ability to uh, install, as Councillor Warren says, the passing bays um, and potentially some extra parking area, all of which is costed out in the report. Um, so there's probably very little more I can actually add, um, particularly from the rights of way point of view. You'll appreciate a lot of the um, uh, the solutions are actually carriageway related and I might defer to my colleague Rowan Smith who's also been involved in this should any questions on those elements arise but from the rights away point of view there's, there's actually very little we can do to discourage people using the access and we would actively obviously really rather they were using uh, the countryside um, for exercise um, but the the only bit that we would have control of in the countryside unit is the road traffic act section 34 notice which is a non-standard sign um, which indicates that um, driving a motor vehicle on a bridleway is an, is an offence um, but um, there are very limited places we can actually erect those where they would actually have any value um, so there's probably little to be done in, in those circumstances so beyond that councillors that is the report as, as submitted thank you Thank you, Chris. Um, can we move on to questions, please? Uh, sorry, I don't know whether, Cleo, you wish to come in at this stage? OK, thank you, Cleo. Uh, so we move on to questions to either Councillor Wotton or Chris Miller, please. Councillor Renshaw. Councillor Renshaw. Renshaw, Robin, please. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Jim. Well, I support Tim. Uh, Councillor Wooten and his call for action is certainly not acceptable to sit there and allow this to situate to deteriorate. The verges are not constructed in the first place to allow moving traffic usage. So that, that's a, a primary thing with the grass verge. The, the, there seems to be a presumption um, among drivers uh, allowing them to abuse our highway verges to such an extent that the reinstatement cost for this antisocial behaviour, and that's what it is, runs into hundreds of thousands of pounds 
countywide, and it's a preventable cost. Without regulation, it will become worse. The cost will escalate out of control, and our roadside verges will be a liability, not a well-appreciated asset. We might as well then commence a rolling programme of art servicing all, all verges, and that, that, that we just out of, out of order, you know, and, and they wouldn't do much for our green credential. What an eye saw, because it's, it's about the beauty. And I did notice uh, on, on the pictures that um, were posted, uh, somebody referred to those as standard marking posts. Well, it seems to be a well-guarded resource of the county council because there isn't a uniformity across application and use of these across all divisions. And I, I would ask that that be looked into. So from just summed up quickly, there's a lot needs to be done on this. And I don't think we're going to get, get a simple answer. There isn't a simple answer, but I, I do I do support uh, Ray's call for action. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Vice Chairman? Nobody else? Was, oh, sorry, just a minute. Uh, Councillor Mark Whittington. Councillor Whittington, Mark, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I think looking at the two options, uh, sort of the two actions that we've got required, the first one obviously is to take no action. And the second one is to decide that the Council of Court for Action needs further investigation and to seek more, more information. And, 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 and my view is that you know, in this uh, situation where this issue is obviously having such an adverse effect upon the farmer, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's livelihood here is, you know, it's being jeopardised to a certain extent by its inability to sort of access its property. So I really do think that I would be supportive of Action B, that, 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 that we uh, 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 decide that we need the further investigation because I, because I really do think that we do need this. I mean, you know, yeah, potentially there's going to be an awful lot more instances of this across the county. So uh, our options are, are either to pretend this doesn't happen or try to address it. And I think actually it's our responsibility as the Highways Authority to, to actually address this issue. So therefore, I, I, I'm supportive of Councillor Wotton's call for action and, and would be prepared to support um, uh, option B that, that, that we have this further investigation uh, and, a, and a further report. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr Chairman. Councillor Stokes wants to speak. Councillor Stokes, Adam, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. No, I, I fully support Ray on and Councillor Wotton on this. Um, I know one of the district councillors very well. <laughs> you can imagine it's my father. So um, I'm well aware of the problems here. So um, we do need to um, seek further investigation on this cause because, as, as Mark has, has previously alluded to, um, this, this can continue throughout the whole county and we do need to come to a, a reasoned position to ensure that this doesn't happen throughout. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Adam. Councillor Brockway. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, fully support this and would like further investigation, please. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to raise, if that's OK, Chairman. Um, I'm very interested. Um, this paper is useful in that it puts forward the, the rights and responsibility. So we've got a situation where we could be starting to do things already. Uh, the landowner is responsible for the riparian ditch. Apparently, he's not maintaining it. So we need to get somebody to enforce that. Uh, the ditch needs to be maintained. That's his job, and he needs to do it. But also, the verges are our responsibility, and we don't appear to be doing that. So we can't really say to the landowners, so, oh, the problem, we can't do anything because you're not sorting your ditch. We are actually not sorting those verges. We've got a responsibility. Look at the potholes at the edge of them, but the verges perhaps could be used if we maintain them properly. I'm not saying, you know, they could. I like the idea of this mesh. Uh, going down, which I've used elsewhere, actually, to great success. Um, so, you know, there are responsibilities here already as part of this problem that are not being fulfilled on either side. So perhaps we need to start with those instead of saying, oh, you know, he's not doing it and we're not doing it. OK, he's not doing it. Let's get him to do it. Then. We're not doing it. Let's get us to do that then. So we start moving the problem. But the other thing that really worries me in this paper is on page 17, it says, um, Methods of legal restrictions such as no parking orders or double yellow lines may also have a displacement effect, may also have a displacement effect. That is a different problem. 
that, you know, because something may happen, yes, you, of course, you look at the surrounding areas and you see, well, if I shut the road here, that's going to have a knock-on effect there. But we need much more detail on that. So, for example, may have a displacement effect, but will it spread? Will that be a spread use of parking or will all those cars suddenly then go and park in the same place, causing a different problem? So in order to come to really any conclusion on this, I'd say this paper is very useful and very helpful. Um, but I think we need more details. So um, my feeling is we are not yet doing what we could do to support the, the moving forward of this problem. And I would like to join the call for further action, please. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Last chairman. Nobody else wishing to speak, Chairman? No, no, for, OK. Um, so moving this forward, uh, there's two aspects of this, and one, one particularly, uh, because I think uh, most uh, rural county councillors would say that after potholes, the destruction and damage to verges is probably the, the next uh, area where I, certainly I get the most complaints from, from residents. Um, but that is mainly on through roads, through villages. This this is slightly different insofar as, as I see it, it is affecting the ability of the farmer to carry out his business uh, effectively. With car parks, cars parked and blocking uh, his entrance uh, to and from his farm. So that, that is where I see this one materially different to, to many, many others, although uh, I would certainly support any action that... Uh, can lead to the restoration and maintenance of verges throughout the county. So for that, for that particular reason, um, I'm, I'm happy to support and thank Ray Wharton for, for bringing this uh, to our notice. And I agree with the speakers have said it's a very, very useful report. I will certainly be keeping this particular report and, uh, and, and working on it. Um, so as uh, Councillor Whittington said, we, we're given two options in the, in the report. Uh, to take no further action or to decide uh, to uh, seek further information and so on. Um, I'm very happy to support that. I think uh, Councillor Whittington moved it and Councillor Stokes, I think, seconded it. Am, am I right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, Mr. Chair, so, yes. Uh, if, if there are no further speakers, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take uh, go to a vote on this. Do we need to do this by recorded vote or by exception? No, you can do it by exception. If you're going for option B to decide that the council call for action requires further investigation, seek more information, if, if that's the option you're going for, then yes, you can do it by dissent. Okay. Uh, and presumably uh, any further report will come back to this committee? Trina uh, or Simon, that's it. Yeah. Or Chris. Hello. Good morning, Chairman. It's, it's, it's Simon Evans, the, the scrutiny officer. Just to say, yes, uh, the, the, the committee would be up requesting through option yep. B a, a little more detail on uh, perhaps on, on some of the some of the options presented and it would come back to this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So, uh, so the proposition, proposition is to uh, support uh, recommendation B or sorry, uh, determination B. Um, are there any uh, in the chat box uh, contrary to that question? No comments at all either way. Okay, thank you. We'll take we'll take that as a unanimous uh, vote in favour of that uh, proposal. And again, to thank uh, Councillor Wharton for bringing this to uh, to the committee, and uh, we look forward to receiving a further report on how we can take this forward. Mr. Chairman, I thank all the committee for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, can we now move on to item six, please? Commuted sums for maintenance uh, in the hands of uh, uh, John Monk. Uh, John, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Committee. John Monk, Head of Design Services within the Highway Service. Um, this paper uh, is in regard to commuted sums. And just as a reminder, commuted sums are amounts of money calculated to cover the future maintenance of assets adopted by the authority. Um, so the income is there to cover the future costs so that the county council is not burdened and there's no profit element in uh, therein. Um, this is a pre-decision scrutiny item with a decision um, in, in the forward programme to be taken uh, during the rest of this week. 
Um, we already have a policy and procedure uh, which date back to uh, 2008 and amended in 2012, which was based on the prevailing national guidance, which was available at the time. For some years now, actually, we've been waiting for national guidance to be updated, and that guidance would be coming from the uh, ADEPT. Um, that is still ongoing, and we're just trying to influence the timing and content of that. However, the feeling is that we need to address some discrepancies that are in the current arrangements that are bringing a lack of clarity on occasions. Um, and so we've updated the policy, which is uh, before the committee for consideration this morning before it goes to uh, a decision. Um, so the proposed policy will set out what we will charge for. Um, it's being prepared in conjunction with colleagues in the development management team. So there is a, a joined up approach to, to make sure that it's, it's hitting both the uh, growth agenda, but also the needs of the highway authority. And um, briefly, what we would actually charge for under this proposal is on Section 38 schemes. It would be for anything that's not included in the specification for development roads that we make available to developers. Um, so, for example, any, anything anything which is is sort of usual run of the mill, so ordinary street lights would be the example I would use there. Um, uh, would not sorry ordinary street lights we would not charge for because they are included in the specification. Um, extra over of anything within the spec, but is installed to a higher specification. So my example there would be going back to the street lights. A higher specification street light for a say a heritage style would then attract a, a commuted sum for that extra element. On section two seven eight schemes, um, something that anything that's over and above our normal maintenance schedules, it, it would be what would attract commuted sum. So, for example, some drainage features um, which require a lot of maintenance, so sort of hydro brakes and technical elements, particularly technical elements like that. Um, and then the third element where we would charge commuted sums for is, is other adoptions that we do from time to time, which can be from um, internal drainage boards, for example, when we might, by agreement, take on one of their um, structures. The policy does allow for exceptions. So if the budget holder considers that the, the newly adopted item can be accommodated within normal allocations, or, and this is where we link back to management and the growth agenda, if it's believed that it might be counterproductive to inward investment into Lincolnshire, um, in which case uh, relevant heads of service would make a decision as to whether the charge is commuted some or not. Um, National guidance, which, as I referred to earlier, is being developed, is not effect, expected to actually affect the, the policy itself, which is before the committee this morning, um, but will probably affect the procedure that would be behind this. So um, what is being proposed is that the policy itself is as is presented to, to the committee this morning, um, but the procedure behind it will be something for officers to develop in line with the guidance when it is produced nationally. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Vice Chairman, any questions for John, please? Councillor Bruce. Bruce, Councillor Bruce, Chris, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Mine is really a, a question. I fully support what's been said, uh, my John, but what's been said. But um, what we're increasingly finding when um, when um, various conditions are and um, when this is done is requests by applicants that they're um, it makes it unaffordable and the affordability thing comes in. Can we ensure we ring fence these to ensure that they survive affordability tests? Because sometimes we grant it, as you will know only too well, sure, we grant at district applications and the extras on are actually a significant reason for the decision, and then they appeal it, and uh, we're, they're not very good. So can we ring fence these to ensure they don't suffer affordability erosion? That's my real question. Thank you, Chris. John? Uh, 
the, the commuter sums that we receive are ring fenced uh, within the highways maintenance budget, so they don't, do get used within that in, in area of influence. Um, in terms of the actual affordability question, uh, um, there is the issue that, that somebody has to pay for the maintenance of these items which are being adopted. Um, and the receipt of the commuted sum and the calculation of the commuted sum is designed in order to actually protect uh, Lincoln County Council as the highway authority uh, from taking on a burden which, uh, you know, from which a developer has actually benefited. However, as I said, there is the test within the process, within the policy proposed, uh, that if it's believed that it is going to be uh, um, contrary to inward investment into Lincolnshire, then that may be an exception that, that uh, Heads of Service would, would um, consider and take. Thank you, Chairman. Very grateful for that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, John. Uh, Vice Chairman? Um, I did have Councillor Brockway, but I presume it's her that said she's backing away. So no, no nobody else now. Thank you. Yeah, Chairman, through you. My question's been answered. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jackie. Okay. Uh, members, uh, ready to move on to a vote? No further debate or discussion? Okay, so, uh, and there's no uh, comments that we wish to um, add to the report to pass back to the uh, Executive Councillor. So, uh, it is a straightforward that the committee support the recommendations on page 29 of the agenda pack. Trina, can we go to the vote, please? Can you have a proposed proposal and a seconder, please, Chairman? Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, happy, happy, to, happy to second it, Chairman. Thank you. So okay, you, Chairman. Okay, you've got a proposal and a seconder. Sorry, Trina, thank you for keeping it okay. straight and narrow. So we move to the vote, uh, committee. Okay, if you can, um, when I call your name out, if you can say if you're for or against or abstain. Councillor Bob Adams. For. Councillor Stephen Rowe. For. Councillor Tom Ashton. For. Councillor Mrs. Wendy Bokett. For. Councillor Chris Brewis. For. Councillor Mrs. Jackie Brockway. For. Councillor Rodney Grocock. For. Councillor Robin Renshaw. For. Councillor Adam Stokes. For. Councillor Eddie Strangle. For. Councillor Mark Whittington. Four. That's unanimous then, Chairman. Thank you, Trina. Before we go on to item seven, I should have said at the beginning of the meeting that if uh, the meeting looks as though it's going to go on at any length, um, we'll have a, a break, a comfort break at about it, or as near to 11.30 as uh, the item on the agenda will allow, uh, and then we will see how we go from there as to whether we continue after lunch. So uh, moving on to item seven, uh, local transport plan. Vanessa, please. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you to the committee for um, uh, allowing me to come and talk this morning about the development of the fifth local transport plan. Members will see in the paper in front of them that uh, we are continuing our work developing the LTP and you will recall that my colleague Jason Copper came to talk to you back in December to talk about uh, the, the reasons that we were starting to work on this document. Uh, today I just wanted to share with you the work that we've been doing um, and the progress we're making really uh, to keep the committee informed uh, of the work um, uh, that we're doing. So uh, since we came to talk to you in December. We've been busy meeting with uh, transport boards across the county and with relevant stakeholders and partners and starting to really develop a, a real feel for, for key themes throughout the document. And you'll see a number of those detailed in the paper. So as, uh, alongside all those um, what we might call modal themes, the cycling, walking, uh, uh, fleet issues, um, uh, uh, HGVs, uh, all those different mode uh, considerations. We're also very much thinking about things like the environment, uh, very conscious of the, the County Council's Green Master Plan commitments, uh, the impact of COVID, um, both in, ter well, in terms of the economy, certainly, 
for Lincolnshire, um, changes to society potentially, uh, but also impacts on the transport networks themselves. So we've seen massive shifts and impacts, particularly on the local bus network, uh, on rail, um, both of which are, are currently being hugely subsidised um, uh, by central government and starting to think about what will recovery look like in those spaces too. Uh, certainly also uh, thinking about those place-based issues, uh, the budget last week announcing things like the levelling up fund, what that means uh, in terms of transport world, um, and certainly very focused on that sort of growth and sectors piece. So things like uh, the impact of walking and cycling for the visitor economy is a, a particular consideration. But also we talk a lot about um, uh, the needs of the, the food valley in particular in terms of uh, Lincolnshire uh, and really those, those movements out into the strategic network network um, uh, in terms of goods uh, um, in and out of the county. So really there is also a, a consideration about drawing together some of the, the excellent work that the, the transport boards have done, things uh, such as the cycling strategy under an umbrella, um, but also sort of building in things like uh, work on, on sort of more detailed work on things like rail, uh, bus, um, and drawing in the, the work of uh, the route action plans that are also being done at the moment. So it's a really wide ranging piece of work. We are certainly still very much in the middle of it, but it felt appropriate to, to come to committee today um, and um, really continue to, to gather views and thoughts of members and help to, to shape the work that we're doing. Um, so um, happy to, to uh, take any questions if that suits you, Chan. Thank you, Vanessa. Steve, any questions from members? Yes, firstly, Councillor Brockway. Oh, Vanessa thank you, Chairman. Brockway. Yeah, thanks ever so much for this. It's great that there's such a wide-ranging review. Um, I wonder if I could raise, on behalf of people in my division, um, the concerns that they're having, that things like cycling and walking are not quite where they should be. Are they, I've, I've been asked to join a working group, and I have, because there are particular concerns that the improvements, the very good improvements that we're doing to the bypass um, um, near Nettleham and Riseholme are making it impossible for people to cross from Nettleham and Riseholme to Lincoln and back. Um, so it's become dangerous for cycling and the cycling paths from uh, the A46 all the way to Dunholm and Welton. It, it's unusable. And I have been asked to raise this. So as part of your wide ranging policy, um, if we want to encourage the tourism, well, I would suggest, could I ask that we look very carefully at how we're going to create the means for people to do this? Because if we want them to cycle, the cycling paths have got to be usable. You know what I mean? And if, if we want them to go from Lincoln all the way up and have a cycle road, they've got to be able to get across the bypass. So just to let you know that that is going on, that working group, and if you want any more detail, I'd be very happy to let you know who it is and when it is, and you'd be ever so welcome to join it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jackie. You. Steve, any further questions or contributors? Councillor Renshaw. Thank you. Councillor Renshaw. Robin, please. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I support Councillor Brockway and what she says about crossing the, the A46. I, I, I walk down there regular. And uh, it's very difficult to cross the road. And it's not safe to do so. So I'd support her on that. What I'm going to say was nothing to do with that. And she just reminded me. But I do feel that uh, we're starting to address some of the fundamental issues. And we are moving forward. And I think we've got to move, move forward slowly based on, on evidence. And, and post-COVID is going to present a lot of problems. Uh, uh, not necessarily produce quick fixes to them. So we, we've got to to consider it with the, with the with fine detail and make considered decisions. Uh, just to comment on the on some of the charts, uh, I think that, and this is this is a commonplace across the county council. Some of the, the charts are presented for us to read, especially for us older people, uh, are very difficult to read. And uh, and the, the the rule I was always taught uh, in O and M was that legibility is aided by using black type on light backgrounds and white type on dark backgrounds. So if Vanessa would make a note of that when she produces charts, I'm sure that, that will be helpful. It, and it's not just about members being able to read it, it's about everybody being able to read it. And we want to make a, the wider audience as possible. Um, 
just talking a little bit on about reduced transport because it may require in the future a reduced service to an acceptable level, but not but not cuts that necessary stim- uh, frustrate demand. But buses buses currently service buses are, are, are run with only one or two passengers on them, and and clearly that is not sustainable, and it's certainly not a, a good omen for our carbon carbon footprint. And certainly, it, it also puts into jeopardy the the, vi- the, uh, the viability of, of the businesses. And we do want to encourage businesses, but it's as I say we can't make a decision straight away. Reducing peak time congestion is is a, is a dream until the LEA recognise every school is a good school, and the nearest for your dearest is good for our carbon footprint. And it's innovations like that simple word which convey what we really would be thinking about. And and, con- and also following on from uh, reduced work and tear on our highway network, for instance, it may, it, it, we never know, but we were to monitor it, no doubt, that, that the, the reduced work may, may, re- may reduce the, the need for the priorities of some of the early um, <coughs> The early early schemes, and we may be able to rephase the capital program and and rephase the, the the highways asset management future. But it's important to not to act act in haste and repent at leisure, as they say, post COVID. And finally, just to talk about the tourism activity. Clearly, uh, there's going to be a lot of benefits to Lincolnshire for tourism, but we've got to have the the um, somewhere for people to go. It's not just having a, a, a town or street name or a place name to go to. There's got to be an attraction, and that's for the capital A. And at the moment, I think there's a lot of attractions in Lincolnshire which are a bit jaded. And, and you know, there is hope on the horizon. The, the new, uh, uh, the new um, upgrade of the Lincoln Cathedral Centre, certainly you walk around the garden, it's very peaceful this time of the year. And it's nice to walk around that. So it just shows things are moving forward and we need to support business here wherever we can. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Robin. I think many of the comments you've made, a bit like your ties, strike a chord with many of us. Uh, next uh, speaker, please, Steve. Councillor Strangle. Councillor Strangle, Eddie. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to concur with uh, Jackie's comments earlier uh, regarding crossing the bypass. The problem we've got with the bypass from uh, the A46, the Bentley Hotel area, right up to the A15, uh, and in fact the 158, is that part of it is owned by Highways England, and the other part comes under our authority. And it's very disjointed. You go from one stretch as Highways England, then into uh, LCC, and then out again into Highways England. Uh, the problem we've got here in my patch in Birchwood is the crossing the bypass for cyclists and pedestrians, especially around the uh, the uh, Skellingthorpe roundabout. And the Skellingthorpe roundabout, of course, is in Highways England's authority. And that's the issue. So I suppose my comment is all about trying to get joined up uh, working between LCC and Highways England to improve these areas. And I'm not just talking about my patch. I'm talking about right Going going north on the bypass from uh, uh, the Bentley Hotel. That's the best uh, description I can give it. Uh, the A46 down south. So uh, I thank you for that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Steve, any further? Yep, Councillor Brokart. Councillor Brokart, Rodney, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, the only question I was going to say in respect of the tourism side of it, will the LCC be liaising with other levels of councils? Because obviously it's in the interest of parish councils and district councils to be involved in tourism. Everybody's got an interest in tourism in their own area. And sometimes that um, um, the county don't pick up the, the little nitty gritties that are a big concern to villages and, uh, and smaller councils. Levels. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rodney. Any further contributors, Steve? No, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Vanessa, for the report, and thank you for members uh, for the uh, comments that have been made. So, the actions that we uh, were asked to do is consider the development of the local transport plan, 
share thoughts and ideas to help shape the document's uh, development. And I think we've done that. And I know Vanessa has been, been making notes of the uh, comments made by members. Thank you for that, Vanessa. <coughs> and, excuse me. <coughs> to receive a, uh, further report as the plan is being finalised. So I think we have done all that. So I'm happy to propose that uh, the committee note the development of the local transport plan, request that the committee... Somebody's got a phone ringing, I think. To request that the committee's comments are considered uh, and to receive a further report as the plan is being finalised. Uh, I am happy to uh, move that. Do I have a seconder, please? Uh, thank you, Chris. I think that was Councillor Bruce. Uh, I think, uh, Trina, we do this by exception again? Yes, Chairman. So I'll just leave it for a few seconds to... Uh, to give members an opportunity to uh, <clears throat> say they uh, don't support that or they're abstaining from it. Any, any comments in the chat function? No abstentions and nobody against. Thank, sorry, no abstentions and nobody against. That's unanimous. So uh, thank you, members. That is agreed. Uh, so if we can now move on to item eight on the agenda. Excuse me, just clearing my throat. Um, uh, gully cleaning, uh, repair and surface water flooding. Uh, and this is in the hands of uh, Richard Benwick and uh, Sean Busher. So Richard, please. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning to the committee. Um, I'm Richard Fenwick. I am the County Highways Manager. Um, as uh, the chairman pointed out, uh, Sean Butcher, who's the county programme manager, this was meant to be um, a bit of a double act because it covers um, uh, tasks that range across our teams. But unfortunately, Sean wasn't available this morning. But um, I'm sure I can uh, cover any questions that would relate to, to either pieces of work. So we came to the committee late last year um, and presented a report around um, reactive cyclic and planned aspects of highways drainage maintenance, uh, which also includes low level flooding response. Uh, and the committee asked that we, this becomes a regular report with updates. So this is our first update, uh, which I will talk you through. I won't sort of read, read through the whole report in detail. Um, however, obviously I'm happy to answer questions on it, but what I would like to pick out some key, key points within that. Um, of the 181, thousand gullies and catch pits and offlets in the routine cyclic program which is done once a year um, 142,000 of those have now been cleaned um, with the remaining assets expected to be cleaned by the end of April um, normally we would have that done by the end of March but with COVID last year there was a slight delay on the start of the program so we are on on track at the moment and one thing I would say is uh, within our new highways term maintenance contract with Balfour Beatty um, there is a lot clearer management of that cyclic programme of drainage cleaning. There are, as you'll notice, 9,000 assets which require specialist traffic management. When I say assets, obviously I'm talking about uh, uh, gullies, catch pits and, and offlets here. I, I shouldn't really use technical words. Um, but they're at places, as you can imagine, sort of roundabouts or on the A17 where we've got sections of dual carriageway where um, the tanker can't just turn up and start cleaning the gullies without um, traffic lights or even lane closures where there's very fast traffic there. Um, so that has been ongoing since December and will continue to sort of detach from the main programme to do those more difficult sites. Um, there have been 6,025 defects recorded on those um, highways, uh, offlets, gullies and um, hatch pits so far including jam lids, broken ironwork, et cetera. One of the benefits of this new contract and the more sort of the embracing of technology is that uh, the gully cleaning subcontractor does take photos of these, send them straight through. If they're an emergency, they're called through immediately to our network resilience team for, um, for emergency works to make that safe. But just that kind of intel from site in real time has been a fantastic improvement for us to deal with things. We've got nine tankers on that contract working in Lincolnshire on a daily basis. Um, seven of those are on routine cleaning. Um, one's completing, completing those difficult sites uh, and one is doing jetting work on blocked assets, which I'll 
talk about in, in, a, in a little bit. One thing that members were keen to ask questions about, and I'm sure there may be some questions today because it is an ongoing uh, situation that we're trying to improve, is the, the reporting and updating through the website, the Customer Service Centre and, and Fix My Street. So in this report, I have um, included some details and uh, I'd, I'd just like to talk, talk you through that because I think it's important. Uh, for the confidence in what we have done and continue to do to improve that. Um, essentially, my team, the local highways teams, are, are the first point of contact for those and everything comes in through Fix My Street unless it's a reported flooding, which is a risk to life or property or over half carriageway, which goes through to the emergency team, comes through to the local highways officers, of which we've got 19 across the county. Um, so we're, we're trying to instill in them a, a sort of hierarchy of their response to, to give a quick uh, but also useful response to the public. Um, so the way they think think through things is that if they go out and have a look and the gully is simply blocked um, and it's either due on that cyclic program very shortly um, or it's it's not causing anything other than a minor nuisance, sort of some puddling, which it obviously isn't great, but it's not affecting anyone's property or, or the carriageway like there's no safety risk there and it is clearing quickly they select a status which informs the public that um that essentially it will be cleaned on the next program schedule um and we've changed fix my street because it used to give a very frustrating response that mentioned grass cutting and weed spraying and just general cyclic work so we have something that's specific to drainage cleansing now and what it also doesn't do is say that that will be done sometime in the next year because that as you can understand from what I'm saying, they wouldn't actually select that status if it wasn't due soon anyway. Um, but again, it sometimes made it sound like we weren't interested and that wouldn't be done anytime soon. So the next thing is if the cyclic isn't, isn't expected shortly uh, or if, or and or if there's an issue that warrants more immediate intervention, then we raise an off-program off jetting job so we get the tanker there sooner. Um, and we would update that report so that they would get the notification that works are scheduled and they would receive the updates from that point on. Um, just as an aside, we are doing some further work to make that a bit clearer so it isn't just sort of a hanging works are scheduled, but also to give some idea about response times and that is a current development that we're, we're looking at with um, both internally and with the provider of Fix My Street. Um, if more significant drainage works than even the jet off-programme jetting team can solve uh, are needed, uh, and that might sometimes be that the off-program jetter goes and tries to clear through and finds that maybe pipes pipes are broken, etc. Then we have now got the uh, community maintenance gangs. We've had them for the last year with AJET working on uh, dig down and significant investigations. Uh, then our officers will raise a job for, for that to be like the next step in the escalation process. That would also have the same in, um, sort of updates that works have been scheduled and that we will be attending to carry out those works um, and then finally in areas where um, none of those sort of reactive uh, approaches are appropriate because the issue is either it's a low priority and risk um, and or because longer term works and investigations with other authorities such as the drainage boards um, which may take over we kind of worked to that four months has been a what we instruct officers to use if we're not going to do anything within the next three or four months, uh, even if we do have work plans, we will use a new a status which gives a bespoke response to the customer. That is where the officer will be expected to put full notes that will go back exactly as they said with some checking by business support um, to basically say, well, we're not going to be doing anything immediately, but we, this is our plan to sort this out. And often with drainage things, it can become uh, a big a big problem that involves ditches, as we've mentioned, riparian ownership, et cetera, even working with the Environment Agency over water courses. Um, so it, it should help move away from some of the, the issues we've had in the past. And uh, I what I would say is I'm aware that there are times where there's human error in what sometimes our officers can be a bit um, keen on using a status that will say that it'll be dealt with in the cyclic programme and we're continuing training with them. Um, although what I would also say is that um, just for some context, in January we had um, around a thousand reports of, of drainage come into those 19 offices just in January alone. Um, so sometimes they do, especially when we have drainage events where um, the gullies might be overflowing for a short period of time and then the water dies away because uh, it's a significant event. Uh, they do have to use a system of uh, triage to make sure that we're 
responding to the most urgent ones uh, and the the response to the the more minor ones might seem a, a little short and to the point at times um so we're just trying to make sure that we give the best customer experience we can um there's an update in the report at the dewatering bay um that's a, a piece of good news that was put in last year and is now being used by our uh, gully tankers we've got six new local employees that have been able to be brought in because the the operation is much more based in lincolnshire now uh, with a further four um to be in place by the first of april uh, that's got many benefits in cut, including cutting down traveling time to dispose of um of contaminated water as well as uh, reducing our carbon footprint so uh, the section that uh, would be normally covered by Sean. I'm, I'm sure I can take you through that. I won't go into detail about the figures, but uh, figure one sets out the funding for the, the current financial year we're in and for the next financial year, the, the various aspects of money that we've put towards drainage uh, and drainage improvements. Um, in terms of the minor drainage works that Sean Butcher's uh, asset management team carry out, um, there was 300,000 for minor drainage improvements. So those are beyond the scope of what I've just been talking about that my teams would do, even up to the age yet soon. Um, in the current financial year, we've delivered 30 schemes costing them around 436,000. So as you can see, that's that's gone slightly over, um, but we've increased the budget for next year, um, which so it, it's just a continuous flow of those schemes. Those sort of things include replacing sections of damaged pipes, additional gullies and manholes, um, in, and in, even up to increasing size and capacity of drainage systems over small areas of village. Um, in terms of development drainage, um, uh, members will be aware that there was a £2.2 million allocation uh, to our floods and water team uh, from the Investor Save bid. Um, We've delivered seven schemes to date because these are these are really big schemes and improvement schemes that are even beyond what the what Sean Butcher's asset management team would be delivered. So there is sort of a clear hierarchy of these the size of these schemes, um, and uh, Technical Services Partnership are very heavily involved in delivered those, um, and uh, they are actually bringing in more design staff to deliver more of that budget throughout 2021-22 to make sure that we get all of that money spent. Um, uh, and the local highways teams through all the way through feed into the prioritisation, working closely with the floods and water team and their section 19 investigations to make sure that uh, there's a joined up approach to, to those works and making sure we're, we're spending the funds in the right places for the people of Lincolnshire. Just quickly talk about the community maintenance gangs, uh, which was... Um, there was a community maintenance fund additional to our normal reactive fund for 2020 slash 21. Uh, and one of the wings of that funding that we decided was important was to bring in a local uh, drainage company, AJET, that we'd worked with directly in the past through Balfour Beatty to, to be sort of one of the aspects of community maintenance. And that's been a really successful thing for our local highways officers throughout this year because they've been able to do that detailed investigation and some dig down and minor civils repairs. So it doesn't ha it's a much more reactive way of dealing think, with things rather than it having to go into future programs. Um, as I've noted, the, these crews have dealt with um, 115 sites so far this year, 115 jobs they've completed, um, all tied to where we've had reports of se severe flooding. Essentially, we're prioritising that based on the reports we've had, tying it in with the Section 19 reports and just trying to use them to focus on the, the areas where in flooding events that have been the most critical. Um, we've already got a another 125 sites identified for over the coming months to just, they've just been flat out over the last year working five days a week. Um, a quick note on those Jessin works, taking it back to the, the, the sort of um, the day to day, um, around 1% of the assets that we talked about in the cycle have been identified of having a block connection. So that is a lot of block connections on the network. That's about eight issues a day to solve, which isn't always achievable. So um, there is an element of uh, risk assessment in that from local highways officers, which goes a little bit back to, you can have a blocked connection that isn't really creating too much of a problem for people, even in, in moderate to heavy rain, or you can have one that does uh, cause a significant issue. So we're trying to use the data that we've got to, to focus our attention there. 
Um, and then finally, just um, some notes on the Section 19 investigations that are ongoing through the floods and water team. Uh, highways are, are trying to work very closely with the floods and water team. The local highways managers chair the local drainage groups, which the floods and water team, as well as the drainage boards, Anglian Water, District Councils and Environment Agency are on. Um, and we have um, mapped out uh, all of our flooding and drainage inquiries for the last 10 years. And we're currently overlaying that with the Section 19 data, not only to check that they obviously correlate, but also to, to try and focus those works that uh, AJET are doing for the local highways teams that are being fed up to Sean Butcher's teams to do slightly bigger works if, if we can't solve the problem there, or then into that uh, really large scale work that TSP are involved in if, if we can't solve the problem at that level. So really trying to have sort of a uniform hierarchy of response through from that emergency response on site through to large scale drainage schemes that might take into account a whole village system. Uh, so with that, um, I will conclude uh, and hand over back to the chairman. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Richard. Uh, now move on to questions from uh, members, Steve. Councillor Renshaw. Councillor Renshaw, Robin, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, well done, Richard. There's certainly the service is much improved and Richard is in receipt of a lot of my emails, and he's, he's got one in his email bag now. But it's important that we we, we have the contact and able to um, record with, with people <coughs> uh, concerns of where we feel an issue has not been addressed, and that will get to a resolution. And I feel that I've got resolution in a lot of the areas, uh, and uh, I, I, will, I will keep... Uh, monitoring the, the, the work that's been done and, and ensure that the, the, the next time it, we get rainfall, it, the, the, there is no problem in certain areas. And I think that's important. Besides that, it gives me good exercise. The, the, there is a problem as well um, in, in urban areas, we, well, in, in all areas, we've got a lot of trees and, and, and the, the drainage works often are in, are in close proximity to, to, to trees. And, and sometimes it requires uh, trees to be removed. Um, and and the, the tree 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 roots do pose a potential problem. If if for instance that the, they're not re removed uh, and they're allowed to, to flourish, then they become a liability in the future. Whereas if they're just left, we, we can manage it for a year or two because the water will will, will eventually drain away from from a flooded area, and and. Uh, we, we will be satisfied with that, but it's just about the rate of, of, of disappearance of, of, a, of a mini flood in an area. And I think it's a lot of it, it's certainly in my area, is, is down to a lot of the tree root growth, which have not been necessarily um, re removed at the right at the time when they should have been. They've been left, I say, left to grow. And, and I would have, Richard, got any stats of... of uh, problems that are attributable to, to, to tree, tree root growth interfering with the network because clearly um, I've seen some exposed uh, openings in, in, in the systems and I've seen the way that the, the tree roots do, do interfere with all, all the, all the uh, environmental services including BT and gas and things like that and you know we, we're trying to build some sort of resilience into, into the network we don't want damage caused by unnecessary things that, that, that we maybe could control. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Steve, next uh, speaker, please. Next speaker is Councillor Brockway. Um, thank you, Chairman. Oh, Thanks for, for this report, Richard. Um, Chairman, I just wanted to raise something. We've got a significant issue in my division at the moment where back gardens and things are flooding, and it's a riparian issue for the most part. But I would like to acknowledge to the committee the huge help I've had from Richard and uh, an officer by the name of Steve Hudson, way up and above the call of duty, uh, to the extent of trying to help residents. Um, well, really, it's not a county thing, but uh, making life, you know, trying to take worry away from people and I do appreciate that and so do they so I wanted you to know about that. Um, now that's where I wanted to ask questions about we're clear that we have um, riparian responsibilities and that those are not highways and um, I've looked into it about where we abut the road and things like that and it's still a landowner who is responsible for the ditch but we've got a number of situations where old houses they built in the 60s are now flooding because 
over the years, people have um, covered their ditches in and the ditches were covered in before they even bought the house. And in some cases, I mean, there's one resident in, in my division, she's pumped out about 900,000 litres of water from her back garden. And it's ongoing and we cannot find a way uh, to improve this uh, this problem. So I'm wondering, given that this isn't a county council issue when it's riparian ownership, um, but we've got an increasing problem with an ageing population where people can't necessarily dig out their ditches and it's causing flooding. I wonder, is there any help and advice the county can give to try and in improve what is in, you know, becoming a, a bigger and bigger problem? This wasn't happening five years ago and it's now happening regularly. The other thing I wanted to ask for, one of the things I found difficult in the process of trying to help my residents is tracking where the old dikes are. And I wondered if it was possible somehow to gather, to, to over time, gather together and produce a document where we can find, we've got a record of these dikes, where they start, where they flow out, where they've been infilled, so that we could quickly look to see where areas of responsibility lie and perhaps prevent some misery. But I really, you know, to finish, I would like to acknowledge that the help I'm getting from these officers is superb. You should know, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Before I ask for the next speaker, Richard, you'd like to make comment on one or two of the points that have been made, please? Uh, yes, uh, to start with the tree root situation, uh, off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to give accurate data around the number of sites, but uh, anecdotally, we do have a lot of issues with tree roots. Um, one of the the things that having AJET through that community maintenance works is they are geared up to have root cutting equipment, uh, which has helped uh, in a lot of these situations. Um, so I will make a note that when we come back with our next update, I will cover the tree situation as best I can to, to give a, an idea of the scope of that uh, and what we're doing about it. Um, and just to say that um, our development management team are aware of the problems that um, tree roots have caused in the past and it might not be able to do anything about the existing problem but there is a lot of work um, locally and nationally going into making sure that whilst we still want to put trees in on developments uh, that their root systems are much more controlled going forwards which maybe they they weren't in the past and it's a, a part of it is the selecting the right type of tree as well because some are more invasive to drainage systems than others um mo moving on to um the other questions um about uh, riparian issues, uh, there is a, a, a subgroup that's been set up of the, by the floods and water management team that is specifically looking at that. Um, and I think that will be very useful because uh, we've got our comms team involved as well. And just looking at the messaging publicly uh, in general around riparian responsibilities, but also covering the exact detail because it can get quite complicated. Um, so that um, all teams, including the local highways officers that might be the first point of contact, can go out and uh, in a friendly way make uh, um, the public aware of what their responsibilities might be. Again, anecdotally, most of the situations I've been involved with, with flooding that are riparian, it is often the person that's made the complaint that is responsible for the solution, technically speaking. Um, but... Um, yeah, tying into what's already been said, I think without prejudice, we, we, with the extra resources we've had over the last year and that we've got, we've budgeted for going forward, um, we do try and work without prejudice to solve problems as much as we can, uh, while still setting out that, that clearly it, it's not, not an ongoing responsibility for the county council. But um, I think that all of the local highways managers will try and work with partner authorities to to solve issues. It's just that. Again, we need to furnish parishes and individuals with the knowledge of maybe what, what is required of them in future. And we are trying to take a heart, you know, whilst we'll be helpful, we are trying to take a firmer line working with the internal drainage boards on um, enforcement of uh, riparian issues. Because I, I think that with the weather events we've had over the last five or 10 years combined with uh, my perception is that there's probably been a, a less attention to um, local ditches and dikes being cleared out regularly. It has, it's catching up with us now, and we've seen uh, in 2019 and 20 some of the results of that. Um, and then finally, on the point about the mapping of those, um, the local highways managers and I often go to the drainage boards who have got uh, LIDAR surveys and 
have, have good detailed records of some of their systems. Uh, but historically, drainage records aren't fantastic. Uh, and we're guilty of that within highways as well um, in terms of our own highways asset. But since we brought Confirm Asset Management System in in 2010, we are mapping in much more detail that our own drainage systems as well as notes of uh, ditches and dikes um, outfalls just because drainage can be quite a complex problem. So um, again, the answer is that yes, we are on that and we are getting more detailed maps and that the information is held internally. So if councillors do want to uh, have any idea about their parishes and, and what the responsibilities are, the best point of contact is the local highways managers in the first instance um, who will liaise with the floods and water teams. And if we already know, we'll share that detail. But if not, we'll probably be speaking to partner organisations to see what, what everyone holds. And we'd like um, eventually to have that information all captured in one place and mapped. OK, thank you. Okay, Bob. Your mic's off, Bob. Thank you, pardon. Yeah, so, so, thank you, Steve. Next speaker, Steve. Thank you for that, Richard. Next speaker, Steve. Councillor Grocock. Thank you, uh, Rodney, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Richard, for that report. Um, how do I start? Um, in respect of South Holland, Richard, as we know, it's been the wettest year recorded for rainfall. I have a feeling that it won't be the last one. I think this will be a change in the weather system and things that highways have got to get a grip with. But I think this is the right platform, Richard, to say that um, all the flooding issues in South Holland that we've had I'd like to uh, send my appreciation to the team how well you've coped with all my moans and everybody else is moaning to me. You've done a superb job. Uh, you've managed to keep the, uh, the uh, people of South Holland's feet dry and I'm very grateful for the team for that. In respect to using Councillor Richard Davis's words, um, South Holland or south of the county roads have took a heck of, hell of a battering. And, um, uh, you know, I've got a feeling, Richard, it'll be battered a lot, lot more. There's just one thing, Richard, that now I've mentioned it to the leader of the council, but I think I'll use it also on this platform. Um, when there's been a flood issue in South Holland, we found it very difficult in respect of contacting highways. What has happened is um, councillors, district councillors have gone out, for instance, in Austin Dyke Road when there was uh, a slippage and uh, the councillor put his lights on and he tried dialing all numbers he could get hold of and he couldn't get anybody from highways. When the drainage board people came out, they mentioned it again and they said they have difficulty getting, getting hold of highways on the numbers. And dialing the 101, Richard, is really a nightmare. And I mentioned this to the leader and he said he agreed and he said we'd look at this. But I just thought I'd raise it at this uh, platform just so that isn't forgotten. I do feel it's an excellent job you're doing. I do feel that um, the drainage boards, who I take very seriously, if they can't get hold of you in emergencies, very easy. I do think that looks uh, does need to be looked after. But apart from that, Richard, chuffed a bit to what you're doing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, do you want to make any further comment, Richard, or take one or two more? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can I'll certainly acknowledge that, and uh, it is something that we realise certainly in uh, uh, sort of the Christmas Eve time uh, situation with flooding that we had. That um, it's uh, with all of the emergency services all involved in these things, the the lines of communication, especially in the current setup where we um, might normally be in a room together, and uh, this time weren't in a room together. Uh, we have taken that on board, and and. Um, I understand there is a, a paper going to the executive around a flooding response in general, but uh, we have taken on board the comments about contacts uh, because in reality, 
I, I think we realised that um, unless certain individuals had, had say, me or uh, local highways managers' personal numbers when we went on call, it was very difficult to get through. And hopefully we did respond satisfactorily when we were. But uh, just working with our out-of-hours team and the, that out-of-hours contact, we will be expanding the, the availability of, of a line for flooding, for example. Um, um, and making sure that um, our partners do have ways to contact us and are clear about that. Uh, and so there is a lot of work currently ongoing into making sure that before, <laughs> unfortunately, I say when we have the next flooding event rather than if, because I, I think everyone's right, it will become a more common thing that, that we're able to respond to that much better than, than we have maybe uh, in certain circumstances. Thank you for that, Richard. Steve, uh, any further speakers, please? Councillor Brewer is next. Uh, Councillor Bruce, Chris, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, Rodney said some of what I was going to say, and I'd like to thank them as well for the response that's been done. The Christmas Eve event, and I sit on a drainage board, was the wettest Christmas Eve since uh, 1939. It was extraordinarily clear, and of course proves that rain doesn't come at convenient times for us, does it? But I have to say I've appreciated the attempts that have been done but a particular point to make to Richard is that I find it's um, very, very helpful. And in many ways, the acknowledgement of a problem is if a there was a dollop of yellow paint is put down by a drain to say, look, we know about this and it's going to be attended to. And then your complaints and our complaints reduce very much as a result because people expect it to take time to do, but at least they know it's been acknowledged and going to be done. So I think that's just the thing that if we were to make that our normal practice, it might help slightly. But other than that, congratulations on a very difficult job done at a very difficult time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Steve, any further? Speak now, Councillor Whittington. Thank you, Councillor Whittington. Mark, please. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thanks, Richard, uh, for the report, which I found very, very useful. Um, as Richard will know, and, and, and because he's been heavily involved in, in the flooding issue I've had between Sedgebrook um, and Allington, um, uh, and also I've, I've had a flooding issue at Woolsall by Beaver. And in both cases, uh, it's been a situation where uh, we've gone out, highways have gone out, we've done the assessments, and actually the problem on both occasions is not with what we're doing as a highways authority, but it's what other landowners are doing. The issue at the railway bridge between Allington and Sedgebrook was the water was coming down off the network rail embankment, which uh, uh, which was which was causing the flooding issue. And I will survive either. We'd gone down and inspected our drainage uh, across Sedgebrook Road, jetted it, inspected it. It was fine. The problem was on one side of the road, the riparian drains by the the, 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 the homeowners weren't being cleaned out, and on the other side of the road. The, the ditch down from our drain down to the local river, which was the natural um, path for the water to flow, was completely blocked. Now, obviously, so so Walthorpe to be taking some enforcement action, and that ditch is now clear. And when we had the recent heavy snow in February and rain, I'm delighted to to report the the work that was carried out. Um, by the landowner in, in, in clearing his, 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 his ditch as men that the water can, can flow away. So in both these cases, we've gone down and we've done everything we possibly can. And the responsibility really that's exacerbating the problems are caused by other uh, landowners. And, and, and I know also, um, as I look through Sagebrook in my village, there's a water flooding issues in the centre of the village. But uh, you can see the water flowing down from the A52 because there's drop from the 52 down into Sedgebrook Village. Uh, but the drains on both sides of, of the road into the village uh, are completely blocked up. Uh, and I know that our highways team are saying their riparian drain responsibility of the land And I'm just wondering, is, we're doing we as an authority are doing fantastic work. But I know under, I believe it's the Land Drainage Act of 1991, that we have powers as an authority to, to take enforcement action against landowners. I'm just wondering if we, you know, as part of our overall response to land drainage issue, uh, to, to drainage and flooding issues, could we to actually do a lot more enforcement work? Because that might then actually stop, uh, you know, a lot of the water from actually 
coming on to our highway. And because, as we know, once water gets onto our highway, it causes us innumerable problems with uh, with cracks in the road and ultimately leading to potholes and roofs falling apart. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Mark. Richard, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, enforcement is complex and there are... Um, various acts that we can use or our partners can use. Uh, I am aware of um, all of the situations mentioned. Obviously, the good news one would be uh, saying if he were here is that there have been some very productive meetings with Network Rail recently between Sean's team and, and them. I would say that in the past, it's maybe been a bit more difficult to, to get um, good liaison going, but they have recently looked at all of the problem sites, the traditional problem sites, and there seem to be uh, solutions to those problems now where we're working well with Network Rail to address those. Uh, I uh, mentioned earlier on that when when we can, without prejudice, we will try and solve problems that are urgent problems that might not necessarily be a highway's responsibility. But one thing we can't do is start going into Network Rail's land and um, uh, sort of prodding around in their drainage systems because obviously there's, there's, there's massive implications to the health and safety of the, the public and the workforce for for work near railway crossings uh, and they take that very seriously so that has been traditionally a difficult area but I think that we've made some good progress there with regards to other landowners um, uh, as mentioned on the main road in Sedgebrook that's actually um, Highways England have some responsibility there and I'm in touch with Highways England at the moment as well as our floods and water team to try and address that particular problem um, if water is discharging on the highway we can use powers under the Highways Act to do something about that but um, the, the, some of the acts that we have don't give us that many teeth to be able to actually follow up on enforcement. Uh, so that's the, the key is where we're working with the drainage boards more closely um, to carry out some of that enforcement action with landowners. Um, they would tell you that there needs to be a, a persistent and recent nuisance to be able to carry out enforcement with people. And if it's been left for too long, um, they might struggle to actually force people to do that. So in the first instance, we do just try and engage with people um, and with parishes on a local level as well, uh, with the support of members to to try and come up with an amicable solution. And we're hopeful that there won't be too many situations where we end up having to serve notice on people. But um, uh, in short, I agree that, that we are finding that we're having to go down that route of enforcement more and more often now. Uh, whereas maybe in the past... Um, parishes and communities were just carrying out that work themselves as, as part of day-to-day -day life i suppose it's the world has changed a bit um uh, since how things used to be run but again the, the onus is on, on us in the first instance to make sure that our highways uh, drainage asset is working um because we we can't really rightly go and start serving enforcement notices on people when we haven't sorted out uh, got our own house in order thank you richard steve any further Speaking. Yes, just myself. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the improvements that uh, have been made and um, thank Richard and his team on behalf of my residents, especially uh, uh, Joe Phillips, who has finally got a flooded estate road that's been going for about 17 years cleared. And I'm sat here with it raining outside, confident that I'm not going to get a phone call, certainly from these residents. Um, First class, you found a major problem, you fixed it, you cleaned it. Excellent. We do have some more, but I'll keep working on. So thank you very much. Thank you for that, Steve. I'd like to add my comments uh, or thanks to the uh, to the team, Richard, for the sterling work that they have done over this uh, difficult period. Um, we, we've mentioned uh, the drainage boards from time to time. Um, but as far as the rural, excuse me, as far as the rural areas are concerned, I don't think we should lose sight of uh, the responsibility of Anglian Water. And I know they have been making great strides. Um, my own property I've had difficulty with for five years, and again, uh, uh, after the Christmas period, they were having to tanker the uh, pumping station, which is next door to my bungalow, and eventually they had to bring in a, a massive industrial pump. Uh, in addition to the uh, work being done by the, the pumping house itself. So they're all great strides I think we still need to make with this working together bit. Um, I do feel where this 
flooding and, and, and gullies and drainage, <coughs> excuse me, is concerned, the rural areas and the rural villages uh, uh, seem to be uh, worse affected because of the lack of uh, infrastructure maintenance over many, many years. And, you know, we've heard about the tree roots and all the rest of it. Uh, and the problem with the gullies is you can uh, they can come along and tanker it one day and there's another uh, heavy fall of rain the next day and uh, the back blocked up again because of this silt that gets into the system. So I don't envy you the problem, uh, Richard, and I do thank you, add my thanks to those where members have, uh, are very appreciative of what has been done. Um, and I'm sure you won't get complacent, and I'm sure it's part of this committee, committee's remit to ensure you don't get complacent, uh, and I'm sure you won't. Um, but I do wonder whether there needs to be a, um, uh, from a financial uh, and resource point of view, um, some greater consideration given to those villagers uh, that for year after year after year, and that the Angry and Water will have this record because of the additional pumps that they've had to put into them. I know Bainton and one or two more in this last period. Um, uh, I'm very thankful of the work that the Flood Risk and Water, Water Management uh, uh, Committee are now doing because they've made great strides over the last 12 months and we look forward to it going forward. There'll never be a complete solution. Uh, I think as long as we can uh, show that we are making an improvement all the while, um, I think that uh, this is the best we can do for uh, for ourselves and our residents. But uh, again, please pass, uh, obviously, the thanks of this committee back to your team and the highways uh, managers. I see um, Brian Smith is sitting in on the meeting. He does an absolute sterling job in my neck of the woods, um, uh, and as I'm sure all the highway managers do. Um, but uh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure you've been making a note of all the comments uh, that uh, have been made, and so uh, I'm happy to propose that the committee note the report and, I, and that, that our comments are considered. Could I have a seconder for that, please? I think second, Chairman. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll do this by exception again, Katrina, please. Yes, just to check, see if anyone dissents, Chairman. Thank you. So I'll leave it for a few seconds. And when we've done this, I, it is just coming up to half 11. We've got a fair way to go yet. Could I uh, suggest we have a 10 minute comfort break and uh, come back uh, and rejoin at about 20 to 12? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. So are, are there any, uh, Steve, any uh, comments in the chat box for, against, or? No, no, no objections, no abstentions, nothing. Thank you very much. I'll say that that is uh, declared that. Uh, 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 resolved, uh, decided unanimously, unanimously, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm getting tongue twisted. Uh, uh, that is unanimous. And uh, so uh, if we would, I'm not going to switch my kit off because uh, I'll just put it on to uh, mute and turn the camera off. Um, and we'll rejoin at uh, 20 to 12, please. Thank you.
Good morning, Chairman. Thank you, Trina, and welcome back, members. Just for the record, can we do a roll call to ensure that we're all back again? Trina, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so if you could just say that you are present. Councillor Bob Adams. Present. Councillor Stephen Rowe. Present. Councillor Tom Ashton. Present. Councillor Mrs present. Wendy Bokett. Present. Councillor Chris Burris. Present. Councillor Mrs Jackie Brockway. Present. Uh, Councillor Rodney Grocock has left chairman now. He did put that in the chat. Councillor Robin Renshaw. Present. Councillor Adam Stokes. Present. Councillor Eddie Strengel. Present. Councillor Mark Whittington. Present. That's it then. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Trina. So we'll move on to item nine on the agenda, street lighting update. Uh, John Monk, please, John. Uh, good morning again, Chairman, Mr Chairman and Committee. So, yeah, John Monk, Head of Design Services. Um, this update follows the successful street lighting transformation project, which was implemented in 2016, um, which saved about £1.7 million pounds a year um, and uh, over 6,200 tonnes of carbon dioxide. And it introduced part night lighting across the county, LED conversions on traffic routes, and uh, uh, a few hundred switch, complete switch offs. In 2018, the uh, committee will remember there was a scrutiny review into the impact of part night lighting, um, which concluded that it was uh, almost entirely a matter of perception. Um, but one of the recommendations was to process for uh, local communities through their, their parish or the equivalent precept raising authority should be able to pay for conversion to all night. Um, and uh, this committee requested an annual report into the um, frequency and volume of such requests. Um, when I reported last March, only one request had been received, which has now been fulfilled, which is for four lights on Grove Close in Pinchbeck. Um, and I can confirm that since then we've had no further formal requests. We've had many inquiries from across the county. Um, including from the public who we just re, uh, refer back to their um, parish council or equivalent. Um, so that there are no further requests to that one that has been uh, actually implemented and, and none that are actually in the pipeline at, at all formally either. Um, so happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Uh, Steve, any speakers? Councillor Renshaw, Robin, please. Thank you. Um, just just a, a quickie. Um, dur during the switch off of certain lights, all the street lights on the on the former Trunk Road lighting network were, were shut off. But I noticed that there's um, some of the 815 north of the rise and roundabout to to the tax office uh, junction, and then furthermore outside the showground. And I suppose it, it, they're probably Highways England, are they, uh, John? Uh, if I can respond, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. No, the um, the A15 north of the north of there is, is is ours, and the ones which are, are are off will have been switched off as part of the transformation project. We just haven't yet found the appropriate funds to actually remove the lighting columns. When they were switched off, they were marked with a red sticker which says that they have been deliberately switched off. Now, I do admit that in some locations, unfortunately, those stickers have actually come off over the passage of time. Um, but you should be able to tell by looking at the column. If it's an LED column, it is probably it should probably be on. Um, but if it's not an LED column, it is one that will have been switched off as part of the transformation project. Sorry, sorry, Chair. The, the, um, the, the point was that they are still illuminated. And that's from the rise and roundabout until the tax office mm -hmm. side road. And then a bit further on, outside the showground to the, uh, um, what do you call it, Lane, Sturton Lane um, uh, roundabout. Uh, uh, I went for my flu 
I went for my vaccination there and, and, and it was dark when I came back, which was the first time I've been out in the dark <laughs> for a year or so. But it, it's one of those things, isn't it? So it, it still still gets like a sore thumb, but you probably have to tell us about that. Um, yeah, yeah if, if I may. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, th I think what you're saying is that, that these lights are still lit, um, and, and that would have been simply been the, the, the situation, the case that there were the huge majority of lights on, on the trafficked routes were simply converted to LED as part of the transformation project. There were, I think it was about a total of 800 across the entire county which were switched off. And as we get around to them, we are removing those remaining columns. So I, I can only assume that ones which were lit were supposed to have been lit because they're ones that we, we did not switch off. Yeah, just, just finally, to, um, on the a, but on the A46, uh, somebody, a driver complained to me that they left the Lincoln uh, roundabout on the A36 went towards Nettleham and it was in complete darkness. So there's, there's two parallels and two different, two similar sort of uh, uh, locations and it, it doesn't ring true on both. But, I, I, you know, the, the answer's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, John. Any further speakers, Steve? No further speakers, Chairman. Thank you, Steve. Just one quick question, John. How how would you quantify an exception? You say annual report, uh, uh, reports on uh, a future report on an exception basis. Can you can you quantify that? Um, I, I I think that if 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 we suddenly had a, a, a flurry of in, uh, inquiries term, turning into formal requests. And I think that's something that we would bring back to this committee for information. Um, when we set this process up and we said that we would bring annual reports, we uh, had no real feeling for the volume that, that, that there would be. You know, we, we, to be absolutely honest, I was expecting that there would have been more than we have had. And the, 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 the simply uh, uh, the four individual lights on, on that Grove Close in, in Pinchbeck, I was expecting that we would get more. So. I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to take the committee's guidance, but I, I, I think if we suddenly get, you know, a ha even just a handful, I think that's probably something that we would flag to this committee that we're getting that interest back again in terms of actually converting to all night lighting. Thank you, John. I'm sure the committee support that. Um, no further questions. Uh, so our actions are to note the report, uh, which I'm sure we do. So I'm happy to propose that the committee the report and agree that further annual updates are on an exception basis. Do this by uh, exception again. Oh, could I have a seconder? That's the first thing I better remember. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, uh, so leave it for a second or two for uh, members to indicate whether they wish to vote against or abstain in the chat box. Anything in the chat box, Steve? No, uh, uh, sorry, um, no objections. Or abstentions, thank you. So if we can go on to item 10, performance report, quarter three, uh, in the good hands of Paul Rusted, please. Paul? Thank you, Chair, and morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm Paul Rusted, the head of highway services. Um, you've got four bits of data in your uh, report this quarter. The major highway schemes update as usual. The Linkage Highways Performance Report uh, for quarter, year one, quarter three. We've got the NHT Public Satisfaction Survey Analysis and the Highways and Transport Complaints Report. Um, if I start with major highway schemes update first, um, I'll assume that the um, appendix A has been read and I'll just take you through some of the um, major changes and highlights. Um, some positive news for Grantham Southern Relief Road is that we've um, issued what we call the Notice to Proceed Now, which is a contractual notice for phase three um, and that's with Galliford Tri who are currently building phase two um, so a major milestone really for the progress on uh, Grantham Southern Relief Road really positive. Um, other interesting or cha other changes since uh, last time I reported holding a roundabout uh, at Sleaford those works have now started um, because I don't drive to Lincoln every day now um, I'm not able to keep an eye on 
uh, work for progress, but um, I gather it's going reasonably well. I'm not aware of any um, major delays that have been caused at the moment, but we have got a series of um, traffic management issues there, so nighttime closures and some lane restrictions, which will have um, um, some impact, but obviously we're working hard to make sure they're as minimal as possible. Um, the only other one to um, pick out for the committee, I think, is Roman Bank Skegness, which is progressing, but there's been some slight delays because of uh, difficulties with the utilities. So some of the utilities, as we, as you know from previous reports, are not always mapped as well as they should be, and are sometimes not at the depths that they um, should be. So that's just caused some slight delays. Nothing major, but just, just need to be aware of that. If I move on then to the um, Lincolnshire Highways performance, so this is really for the three um, Highways 2020 contracts. You'll see there the performance figures, um, broadly similar to last last quarters. Um, some have dipped down, some have gone up, but in, in real terms, no major uh, concerns, I don't think. We have got um, ongoing performance management measures with the three suppliers to make sure that we're either improving those scores where we need to be or maintaining them where we believe that the right level. So I say nothing, nothing major to report to the committee with regards to performance. Um, if we start the three individual contracts, the highway works term contract, there's some data and a, and a table there for some of the things that we've been doing um, uh, with with various elements of work. So you'll see that in that in this quarter we've completed over 10,000 defects. Um, a lot of those are potholes, about 8,200 carriageway potholes, and you'll see listed some of the other things that we've done. So quite a major amount of activity that's been going on there. Um, there are also some more data there about um, the number of gullies that we've cleaned. I think you've had uh, quite an extensive report previously about um, um, some of that element. Um, so I think something to, to reference for the committee as well is some of the severe weather conditions that we've experienced um, during this period. Um, so we've had extremes amount of water, so it's already been discussed, some of the rain that we've had and the flooding that that's um, caused us. We've also had a, 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 an extreme number of harsh frosts and snow, so we've had instances of what we call freezing rain, which is quite unusual, or that's certainly the number that we've had this year. Um, so some nights we've been going out and salting three times a night just to try and keep the network moving. Um, but of course, some of that um, freeze-thaw action that you'll get from, from some of the moisture and then the freezing action has had quite a detrimental effect on our network. Those of you that are managing to travel around in Lincolnshire will see that we've got um, an extreme number of potholes that have developed because of some of this um, weather that we've had. We've put a number of um, uh, actions into place. So we've got a find and fix gang that's working now on some of the major networks to try and make sure that we're on top of these potholes. And the local highways teams are obviously using the community maintenance gangs to try and um, get to as many of those as we can. So, so I think just, just to be aware, so the... Um, We've been out sort of 90 times salting this year already and, and laid about 25,000 tonnes of salt this, this season, so quite a quite a profound season. Um, there's some detail there about some of the uh, mobilisation promises, that uh, tender quality promises that um, Balfour Beatty made. Um, so we're making sure that we monitor those. Those are part of the performance framework, um, and we're making sure that those are, those are carried out in accordance with the contract. So some of those things, some of you may have already seen, things like the depot improvements that um, Balfour Beatty contributed to. Um, we're developing a service engagement app that will be rolled out for um, for members. Um, we've got things like an observation app, which tries to improve um, safety for the workforce. Uh, a number of, of, of different things there that are ongoing. Uh, the next item in your report was community maintenance gangs. So it's just a rep um, some detail there on some of the things that we've been doing. Um, over 2,000 individual jobs that have been completed by the gangs, um, with a further nearly 10,000 find and fixed jobs that have been carried out. So this is where the um, um, Balfour Beatty's gangs are able to do um, further defects and repairs that they find in that location. So we try and get away, get away from the um, complaints we've had previously about we filled one pothole but left the others. So um, we, we, we've tried to change that in the new contract. Um, moving on to the professional services contract, um, th there's some more detail in there as well about um, tender quality pro statements. The main ones, I think, from WSP that are uh, important to the committee is the support that they're offering us on the introduction of what we call BIM, um, sometimes known as building information modelling or better information modelling. 
They're also supporting the introduction of Project Wise, which is a common data environment that we'll be using. Um, so although that sounds a bit technical, it's really about the way that we manage um, data and how we use it to design schemes a lot better. Um, and we, we can also use it then we can tra translate some of that data into our confirmed system for future asset management. Um, and of course, things like the, the common data environment, as it says in the report, that is required for some of our bids to DFT. So having BIM and um, project-wise in the common data environment is critical for helping us to bid against um, other competing schemes. Um, traffic signals contract, uh, some, there's some data in there about some of the faults and signal um, works that they've been doing. Um, Colas have now successfully recruited a full um, a full complement of staff that have had difficulty in um, recruiting um, for the first year of the contract. And I think that's because some of the works that they do, are the, 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 it's really quite a technical um, expertise and it's sometimes difficult to recruit, but they now are up to full speed. Um, I've got a little section in there for your call about innovation. So I just wanted to try and highlight some of the things that we're doing to try and make ourselves um perform better to give uh, you know members of uh, the public in Lincolnshire a, a much better service. So I'll just pick out some of those that I think are sort of really important and really interesting. So we've introduced a, a 3D pothole camera um, for inspection. So that allows us to take 3D images of some of the potholes that we're uh, repairing. But the benefit for that is that it helps us to measure depth and size of the repair and also um, helps us cal calculate the amount of material that we're going to need to, to carry out those repairs. So that means we've got enough material on the lorries when we go out to fix it. Um, another one that we've introduced is a thing called RoboCut. This is remote controlled vegetation cutting, um, mainly used on, on, on slopes. So it stops um, any sort of risk of um, trip slips or, th or other things for the uh, workforce. Um, and it just allows you to be able to control the mower um, sitting at the bottom of the bank. Um, so that's, that's really positive. Um, another one is a thing called the Intellicone, so that's an intelligent road cone system, and this warns operatives when vehicles um, move into our work safety zone, so if they cross the uh, barrier that's set up by cones, it'll just trigger a, a warning to um, the workforce that they've got to be aware and to, and to get out of the way, obviously, if it's going to be uh, um, a collision um, situation. Um, another one we introduced is a, a QR code system, so these are the codes that you probably scan when you go into... Um, shops and other buildings now we've been using it for managing hazardous waste as well so it's an app which allows us to record things like um, the amount of tile bound planings that we've got it just helps us with better stock management very simple system but um, and very useful for us uh, lower temperature asphalt um, this has been around for quite some time now but we've been using quite a lot of this um, as you know, with our use of the laboratory, we're very careful about making sure that we don't put materials into the highway that aren't going to um, give us the sort of length of life that we want. Um, this material is mixed at much lower temperature than perhaps some of the historic mixes that we've used. Um, so it just means a, a you know, substantial reduction in uh, our carbon footprint for the material. Um, so really very positive. Um, JCB Pothole Pro, some of you will have seen that on some of the news um, activity that's been going on. It's um, a planning... Um, machine that helps us to um, excavate um, uh, areas for pothole repairs much quicker than perhaps we've done previously. Um, we've only just tried it at the moment, but it, it has made an increase, um, a substantial increase in productivity of pothole repair. So, so it's one of those things that we're trialling to try and improve um, the service that we deliver. Another one that I found particularly interesting, and, and hopefully some of, some of the committee will, is the use of sonar inspections for bridge scour. So um, what do you see in other parts of the country where you get bridge collapses? That's very usually down to what we call scour. So where the, the, the actual flow of the water under, undercuts the um, um, bridge um, foundations, which is called scour. Um, we, need, we need to make sure we're aware of that and get it fixed a lot quicker. We used to do that with, uh, with diving surveys, but we, we're now using this um, uh small boat towed sonar device, which will help us to identify scour much quicker. Um, and for some of the schemes that we are finding the scour, we get it quickly enough, we can use a thing called rock bags. Um, so these are, as they say, these are bags of rocks which we place in the uh, scour area. And that early early detection allows us to use this much cheaper solution um, rather than um, the more expensive piling that we'd probably have had to do. Um, moving on to the NHT Public Satisfaction Survey Analysis. Um, once again, a slightly disappointing um, 
uh, results, I think, this year. Um, we had a, a good return rate, statistically. Um, there's, there's a demographic, I suppose, profile in there, which suggests that we tend to get um, re- reports back or we get we get a return from sl- the slightly older population. Um, and I think that means that these are people that potentially sometimes complain a little more than perhaps the younger generation do. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that as someone who's in that older, slightly older generation. Um, so we, so considering all the effort that we've put into our higher repairs over the last year, we were slightly disappointed with some of the outputs. Um, we have got a series of activities where we're going to try and um, understand why we don't seem to be able to influence public perception from all the efforts that we put in. Um, we've restarted a national performance management framework group that we're members of um, to try and help us to uh, improve some of those re- um, scores. So I don't intend to go through the, um, the, the report in detail other than to record a sort of slight disappointment that all the activity that we've put in over the last year hasn't quite been reflected in um, the section at the moment. Um, moving finally on to the complaints report, um, and once again, this is slightly disappointing, some increase in complaints compared to quarter three in the previous year. Um, some of that will be down to, I think, some of the exceptional weather that we've had. No particular areas of um, that, that we can mark out other than the, there's the obvious things like potholes, which account for 22% of the complaints, and from things like flooding and some of the other obvious areas that we've got. So I think, Chairman, in conclusion, um, I, I think, you know, you know, considering that we've mobilised the new contracts through a, a global pandemic, um, I think the, the overall performance of the four partners um, is good, um, and we've certainly worked hard to try and minimise the impact of the pandemic. Performance on major schemes is good also. Um, we've, there's been some slight delays caused by COVID-19 and the recent weather events, but we've minimised those as much as possible. Um, so hopefully, Chairman the, and, and the committee, you'll agree that um, performance is in a reasonably good place considering where we've been um, with some of the things that have happened over the previous year. Um, thank you. Thank you. Steve, are there any speak to Councillor Renshaw? Councillor Renshaw, Robin, thank you. Well, you don't, don't want to worry, uh, Paul, about being a bit older because you, you've got that degree, which most of the committee have got, and that's the University of Life. And it, it brings skills to, to the table, so <laughs> it's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, and I like the tab line, strap line we've got there, developing the first time culture for all works where possible. That's quite clear. That That is an important thing. And this report is just the, the f- what one is the first one, isn't it, after the uh, Highways 2020 contract. So consequently, it's work in progress. And I think quite rightly, we are monitoring it. And uh, we obviously look to, to, to future improvement. Um, on, one, on the... Um, contractors uh, presentations I did have difficulty reading them because on, on a tablet when you when you read them they, they they're to la- the landscape and and the spring round so it's more or less impossible to read on a desktop machine it uh, it it's dead easy to read so if, if, if you can look at that when you when you're presenting that report in the future so it covers all users and finally um we we, a lot of the contractors offered to do community work, didn't they, Paul, I, 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 when they took the, the, the contract? And, and one of the things I think that we, we could um, help the community, and, and that's um, the NHS, uh, particularly in my division, I've got the county hospital in my division, and, and, and the one thing I noticed when I walked past there, uh, and, and we have an in- ever increasing uh, number of patients attending there, so it's important that, that, that they're directed to the right place. But on the road side, we've got NHS signs which are bedraggled and, and absolutely filthy. And I wondered if we could persuade any of our contractors if they would use their community action to, to clean some of them signs. Obviously, they get to get permission to do it. But I think that would be a worthwhile thing and supporting our NHS. Uh, and I think that's all, all, all my points. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Paul, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I can do, Chairman. Uh, yeah, obviously, being older is slightly beneficial. I mean, I got my uh, vaccination on Friday, so I'm, for once, I'm quite quite delighted to be slightly older. Um, the um, 
community offer that we've got from all the three suppliers, um, what we're trying to do is actually group the offer together so it can perhaps come up with a slightly uh, more in impactful um, intervention. So there's a group working on coming up with some suggestions which we're going to put to uh, Councillor Davis first and no doubt they'll come through this committee as well. So um, we're expecting that to, to be developed and, and have some ideas around that in the near future. Thank you, Paul. OK with that, Robin? OK, I'll take that as a yes. Any, any further yes speakers? And you would take, take, take cognizance of the of the presentation of those reports for the from WSP, Colas, etc., etc., the landscape. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robin. Uh, Steve, any further speakers? Councillor Brewis. Councillor Brewis, Chris, please. Thank you, Chairman. I too would like to thank Paul and everybody for. I think when we sat on the um, Highways 2020 board for those three years, we never imagined the first year we should have fraught year with a big crisis in it. Um, my particular um, comment would go for, uh, 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 to, I would like to say how much I appreciate the uh, notification of things like road closures and also um, salting runs and so on. I find that extremely useful. But when I, but I'm finding one problem, and I haven't raised this with Paul. I was going to ring him. When I photograph potholes to send through, I'm finding the system won't accept them. So I wouldn't mind having a destination site, which needn't be Nagedney Broadgate, to forward these um, photos to Paul. If you've got any suggestions, because I'm not having poor car is having limited success getting them from me. That was all. That so I think we we can perhaps. Make it better. And as I said earlier to John, I said I think marking potholes it lets everybody know that something's about to happen, and that certainly the further complaints. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Paul, any, any response to that? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll take that um, difficulty that you got offline, uh, Councillor Bruce, if you want. Um, certainly, fix my street should should accept photographs. That's one of the. Um, um, principles of the system. We've been making quite a number of changes to fix my street to try and get make sure we get the right responses out to members of the public, um, just to make sure they don't get endless um, reports of it's in hand or whatever. So we've we've made quite a few changes to that. Um, and there's quite a lot of work going on around this um, engagement app that we've got and the use of what we call Power BI to present data. Um, I know Richard Fenwick and, and others have been working on getting some of that data um, available. And I suppose the question then, and it links to Councillor Renshaw's comment, is to make sure it looks right on the tablet. So um, what looks right sometimes on a laptop doesn't always look good on a, on a tablet. So we, we're doing a bit of work on that before we uh, before we release it. But there should be an awful lot more data coming to you. So I think and, and it, it needs to be relevant data as well, obviously. Thanks, Thank Paul. you, uh, Well, I will take it up with Paul offline. I think um, the particular area, there's a lot of potholes down Sluice Road <laughs> trying to get through, and it wouldn't accept them. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Steve, any further speakers? No, that's everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Paul, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, and I think it would be right to pass the thanks of this committee to all the teams, et cetera, for the phenomenal work they've done through a very, very difficult year. Um, Perhaps not achieved as much as we'd hope, but uh, and again, as you so rightly say, we weren't expecting uh, the pandemics that, that we've had over the past uh, year or so. So I thank I thanks to all the team, Paul, please. So uh, our actions were to consider and comment on the detail of performance. We've done that. Uh, so I'm happy to move that we receive and note the performance report. Could I have a seconder, please? Happy to second it, Chairman. Thank you, Steve. And... Uh, Exception, exception again, just a few seconds for a, any members who are uh, not happy to uh, note the report uh, to indicate in the chat box. Anything in the chat box, uh, Steve? No objections and no abstentions. Thank you, Steve. So we'll move, move on to item 11, opportunities for roadside wildflower planting schemes. Chris Miller, please.
Sorry, keep muting myself. Um, Chris Miller, uh, yeah, team leader for Countryside Services. Um, just a very brief report by way of update on a previous um, paper given back in December 2019. Obviously, during the past year, we've not been able to progress anything in this regard um, due to the pandemic and, and, and pressures elsewhere within the countryside service. Um, but now we're in a position where we can perhaps start to look forward and move forward. And we've been exploring an opportunity to develop a partnership with the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust on a trial scheme um, that they have already uh, in place to a degree, but looking to support and partner them on that with a focus perhaps on some roadside verge planting so that we can evaluate um, much more clearly what the benefits will be, both potentially in terms of cost, but also from the biodiversity and the environmental benefits of uh, managing our verges differently um, in just some localised community um, way. Uh, and really, that is all that the report is about. It's just looking for the support of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Steve, any, uh, any contributors, any speakers, please? Councillor Renshaw. Uh, Councillor Renshaw, Robin, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just be very brief. I do welcome this as a start. It's 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 a great thing. It's it's going to enhance our green footprint. Uh, I, I wonder if um, the officers has seen the, the the Bristol City of Bristol experiment, where they've got a, a, a cutter now that cuts just once per year. It it, it uh, and the the risings just actually go towards killing the, the the grass growth and and that and that in turn enables the wildflowers to prosper so that seems to be a good thing but it, that's been rolled out in bristol and you know we we do learn from other people don't we you know we're not just an island thank you thank you robin any, any comment back chris thank you chairman um we'll certainly bear everything in mind um committee will probably be aware of the existing work that colleagues in the sustainability team have already been doing on verge management with the with the bio harvester um, um, that's been widely reported on as well so it's all part of that but what we needed to do was um, find some appropriate trial sites for specific wildflower planting um, and as I say with partnership with wildlife trust it looks like we may be able to secure some opportunities working with local communities to do so. Councillor Ashton is next. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I will just speak very briefly to welcome this. Um, I think it is something that has a huge amount of potential, um, and I hope this is genuinely the beginning rather than the end. Um, I, I believe that vast areas of our county would benefit. I know the county is um, is looking at tree planting and 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 um, other. Um, things along those lines as part of its um, um, of its work going forward, and anything that makes use of the of, of the available land that we have with the highway network um, is definitely going to be is a good part of that. And the beauty of wildflowers is that unlike trees, their roots don't go under the um, tarmac and suck out the moisture. And if you're um, on an area like I represent and defend, uh, let the uh, road sink in the hot, into the hole next to it. But anything that we can do to um, enhance the bits of the county for which we're responsible is a really, really good thing. And I really welcome this. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Steve, any further speakers? Councillor Brockway. Oh, thank Mr. you, Brockway, Chairman. Jackie, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I think this is great, actually. I mean, if you go into the entrance to Doncaster, I think Princess Road or Princess Way, I can't remember, there are usually miles and miles of wildflower, and it. it's just so beautiful. It raises the spirit. In Saxelby, um, there are a lot of crocus plants and daffodils planted as you go into the village. And I would urge you certainly to contact Saxelby Parish Council because they're already active in trying to promote wildlife, sorry, wildflowers. And um, I, I've been wondering, um, I've noticed as I'm travelling along the A57 that there are significant amounts of litter in certain parts of the verges. So it doesn't go along the whole length of the road. You have lots and lots of litter and then none. And I have wondered if there's anything or any evidence to say that the planting of wildflowers might actually decrease litter. I don't know if there's a link, but it just popped into my mind when you were talking. Um, if there is anything, I'd be interested to know. But certainly I'm fully supporting this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jackie. Chris? Me, Chris, rather than Councillor Brewis. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. Um, well, thank you, Councillor Brockway. Um, I'll, I'll find out more about the litter related um, issue um, because what we can do is perhaps have a conversation with our colleagues in the Wildlife Trust who already manage the roadside nature reserve network that we already have in Lincolnshire and was indeed one of the, in fact, it was, I believe, the first in the whole country um, set up with the Wildlife Trust. So we can ask them if they've noticed any correlation between litter drop and wildflower verges. Or certainly Thank the protected you. roadside verges. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Steve, next speaker, please. Just myself. Um, Chris, this is probably in my top five things that I get asked about. Um, people seem to think they can just throw a few seeds in the grass, let them grow. The ragwort won't grow through, um, and and the other weeds won't go elsewhere. But but it's certainly something I get asked a lot about, and. I, I'm, I did post that this was in today's meeting, and a lot of people are very interested in in how it's going to progress. How are you deciding which communities you're going to work with, please? Not determined yet. We're only really at the evaluation stage with the part we're setting up a partnership. Uh, the Wildlife Trust have a, a a scheme already ongoing called Naturehood. And what we're looking at doing is partnering with them on that um, with then uh, a steer within the communities regarding roadside verges so it's much actually much wider than just the roadside verges looking at all forms of community wildlife benefits it might be in pocket parks or something like that or a bit of land uh, you know that's not being used as part of the recreational ground on a football pitch for example um so but we can now include the roadside verge bit working with our colleagues in highways as to, you know selecting the appropriate ones as well because we need to reflect that you know these are managed areas already to a degree um and we need to reflect on that so um we haven't selected any particular parishes, and but it, the Wildlife Trust is a community. You know, it, it is being community led, so that they will approach the trust. Um, so, you know, any, anybody coming forward, we've not sort of said no, but you know, only in a particular area or anything like that. Um, just uh, on on, on the, the original point as well about you know the, the type of planting. You're quite right that not every form of wildflower planting is appropriate in the individual areas. So, councillor. Brockway mentioned, you know, the routes into Doncaster and so on. We know that the, you know, we've had a similar comment about the route into Rotherham. However, we know that the wildflower they use, they used there weren't native, and we would be looking at using the Lincoln, what's being generated as a Lincolnshire seed bank in, um, in collaboration with Rhizome um, College between the trust and the, and, and the college, where they're trying to create a new seed bank of, of native species and particularly native to Lincolnshire. So we get all the benefits that we possibly can in terms of biodiversity and pollinators. Thank you for that, Chris. Any Thank further? No, nope, nobody else looking to speak. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, I know from my own division, uh, Chris, this uh, report is. Uh, been uh, waiting with anticipation because they're very keen to uh, get involved in this type of uh, environmental activity. So uh, uh, all power to your elbow and let's hope it can come forward as, uh, as quickly as possible. So the proposal is moved that the committee support the establishment of a partnership between the Council and Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust to trial the community-led scheme for natural environment enhancement. I'm happy to propose that, but I have a seconder, please. A second, Chairman, Councillor Brockway. Thank you, Jackie. Can we do this again by exception, members? Uh, anybody wishing to record either against or abstaining, please do so in the chat box now. We've got a, a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Any, anything in the chat box, Steve? No abstentions or objections. Thank you, Steve. So uh, that is agreed. Uh, we now move on to item 12, the committee work programme. Uh, Simon, please. Simon Evans. Yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Um, this, uh, this is the standard item on the agenda which sets out the board work programme for the committee on page 136 of the pack. Um, uh, is a list of items which the uh, which are likely to come up in the new council term, the bullet points towards the end of that page, to which we would add um, the West Street Parkston um, matter, which was the first item on the agenda in relation to the council call for action. 
Uh, so if, the, if, if members of the committee wish to suggest other items for the committee in the new council term, that's the, that, that is the question that can be put forward. The other, the other point is I should stress that there are no items listed for the April meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Simon. Any member wish to uh, comment on that? Nobody asking, no. Thank you. Uh, I think the the intention will be, uh, if there's anything comes up that uh, needs any action, uh, for the committee to uh, uh, delegate it to the chairman and vice chairman, uh, unless it is a uh, an item that does require scrutiny. If any item comes forward, if it's highly unlikely that does require scrutiny, then a, then a meeting will be called. Other than that, uh, this committee will not meet again until uh, June, that's after the county council elections. Um, but I think it would be appropriate at this point to, uh, as this could effectively be the final meeting of this committee. Well, I'll do that at the end because we have got the, uh, the uh, item to uh, the exclusion motion. Um, so if, if, uh, if members of the committee are content with that, can I, can I move forward? I'll, I'll propose that. Um, uh, could, I, uh, could I have a seconder, please? Happy to second you, Chairman. Happy to second that. Thank you, Steve. Uh, uh, so, so we've noted the, the work programme, which uh, for uh, April and May there, there isn't one, but uh, any emergency items to be dealt with by the uh, Chairman and Vice Chairman unless it's deemed that uh, we, we need to call the committee together on, on, a, on, a, uh, uh, on a scrutiny matter. So, uh, been approved and seconded. Can we do that by exception again, please, members? Uh, the chairman hasn't indicated, sorry, vice chair hasn't indicated any dissent. So, uh, I can, I'll say that, that is agreed. So uh, now we're now going to move on to item 13. Nineteen seventy-two, the public be excluded from the meeting for the consideration of item thirteen on the grounds that involves the likely disclosure of exempt, exempt information as defined in part three of Schedule Twelve A of the Local Government Act nineteen seventy-two. Could I have a second, please? Happy to second, Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Uh, we now need to put that to the vote, and it is a recorded vote. Trina. Thank you, Chairman. If you could just say if you're for, against, or abstain. Councillor Bob Adams? For. Thank you. Councillor Stephen Rowe? For. Councillor Tom Ashton? Councillor Tom Ashton? I'll go on. Councillor Mrs. Wendy Bokit? For. Councillor Chris Burris? For. Councillor Mrs. Jackie Brockway. Mm. Councillor Robin Renshaw. For. Councillor Adam Stokes. For. Councillor Eddie Strengel. For. Councillor Mark Whittington. For. Can I just go back to see if Councillor Tom Ashton's there, please? Not at the moment. I can see his picture, but he's not there. So um, that's the majority then, uh, Chairman. Okay. Apologies, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I've, is that? Apologies, I meant, sorry, I was struggling with my mic microphone. Yes, I'm for. That's unanimous from members that are present then, Chairman. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Trina. So I'll now pause until the end of the live, live stream is confirmed, please.